reflecting windows, loop line railways, and the port of Dublin. Beyond Butt Bridge is another world. <laughs> Charlie, how's it going? Yeah, how's it going? How are you keeping? There you are. Grand day this morning. Yeah. How is yourself? Going? See ya. Hello. Do you know, whenever you pass by this old ballast office, you should really raise your hat. And if you're not wearing a hat, you should give it a bit of an old salute. Because you know what? It was the ballast board that gave Dubliners one of the finest ports in Europe. At one time, shallow waters, drifting sands, and the dumping of ballast made the port of Dublin the terror of every sailor, merchant, and seaman. The ships couldn't get up the river, so they had to dock out in Darkey and Ring's End. And they say that you could run around the ships at low tide in Ring's End, and you wouldn't even wet your feet. Work goes on daily with the heavy cranes and the offloading of goods and merchandise at the port of Dublin. But at one time, this stuff all had to be brought along the darky road into the city because the drifting sand made the waters very shallow and the ships couldn't get up the river. This was first noticed in 1652 by a man called Gerard Boat. Ah, there were others, Andrew Yarranton. A man called Henry Howard wanted to solve the problem. And of course, Alderman Hawkins got permission to build a wall at College Green and shoot back the river. And there's a nice boat of grain. And there's the bell. I wonder, is that beer of hour? And there's the dredging going on. At one time, there were 18 ships dredging the port of Dublin. But despite all the dredging that went on, they still couldn't stop the drifting sand. There's no joy in the ferry ride today. Empty. 30 years ago, that would have been chock-a-block with dockers and factory girls going back and forward. Of course, it was only tuppence to travel then. Imagine they'd leave that bit of grain there for the pigeons. So the pigeons like the top bit off the lorry. Now, despite all the dredging, they still couldn't solve the problem. The merchants kicked up a row, said they'd leave Dublin, take their business elsewhere unless the corporation set up a separate port authority. After Hawkins claimed the Lear Street and City Quay, the corporation started reclaiming what they called Newfoundland, the North Lots. The corporation also laid kishes, baskets of stones, to make a canal thrown deep in the river. But the merchants still protested. And in 1707, the corporation established a separate port authority and tried their hand at building walls and dredging the river to make it deeper. But the merchants still protested. And in 1786, the Parliament in College Green called the matter to a head by passing an act and establishing the Ballast Board, the board to preserve and develop the Port of Dublin. And that was the start of the revolution in making the Port of Dublin the great port that it is today.
I'm walking down Misery Hill, Dublin. And this is the spot where the poor outcasts came to die. The people suffering with leprosy, who were trying to make their way on pilgrimage to the shrine at St. James at Compostela. But the disease had spread too far. And they wouldn't let on board the vessels and they wouldn't let back into the city of Dublin. So they were brought down here. A man was implied to walk in front of them with a long white pole. Another man to ring a bell. And a third man to cry, unclean, unclean. This was also a gallows area, a hanging place. There was one man in particular who was hanged on Misery Hill for stealing a calico shirt. This is where they all spent their last moments. The poor suffering lepers, and the poor people that climbed the gallows. They died here on Misery Hill. Well, at one time in Dublin, you had three gas works, the Alliance Gas Company, the Dublin Gas Company, and the Hibernian Gas Company. And in 1866, they all got together, and as the Dubliner says, they had rare gas. They formed the Dublin Alliance and Consumers Gas Company. We've come to the point of the Great South Wall. And what an engineering feat that was, building the Great South Wall. Aye, and the North Wall, and the Great North Wall, which we know today as the Bull Wall. And of course, the engineering feat of the lot, Alexander the Basin. Within the great men in the Dublin Port and Docks Board, aye, in the old Ballast Board, and the great vision they had, in laying out the port of Dublin for us Dubliners. The Bells of City Quay. It's hard to believe that City Quay was underwater up to 1666. But the community grown in City Quay with merchants and sailors and people coming and going, it was decided that it would have to have its own special church. Now there was a Father McCann up in St. Micken's Church and he was left a bit of money. So he put up 5,000 of it to lay the foundation stone of City Quay Church which was laid in 1861. And two years later, in 1863, the church was opened. The church of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, City Quay, was a chapel of ease to Westland Row. But in 1908, it became a separate parish. There's the Holy Communion money, so they're getting two bob. It's telling that mammy now, mammy, that woman gave me two shillings. Do you know what? They should put three big statues on this bridge. One to George Halpin, one to Francis Giles, and one to Dr. Bindon Stoney, because they're the three men, the Port and Dock's own engineers, 
who built the Bull Wall, the Great North Wall, that solved the problem of Dublin, and Bindon Stoney designed the heavy machinery for laying the foundation of Alexandra Basin. Talbot Memorial Bridge, 1978. The fine view of Gandon's Custom House. Foundation stone was laid in 1781 and it took 10 years to build. The chief stone cutter was a man called Darley and he had a lad called Eddie Smith who designed all that sculpture work. That's typical of the civil service. One door and you have to go to another door. <laughs> It's a great thing to bring your children down to the custom house of a Sunday with their sketchbooks and let them sketch out all these heads and masks and then let them find out what they represent because these masks and heads represent the 13 principal rivers of Ireland and the Atlantic Ocean. I'll give you one clue. The only lady head is Anna Livia. Site this was Spencer Dock. And the docks there raised up into the air, and the coal ships coming all down along the, the river. And in summertime, that dock would be flooded to millions of little silver fishes all around the top of that river there. And the kingfisher swooping down, and without even hitting the water, pew, up again with two or three of them little fishes in his mouth. This was where they tied up the boats coming in. Sometimes they held them in the dock up along the river there, through the locks. Thousands of men, dockers, carters, the reed then for the boat, the stevedore, the button men and the casual men, the number seven shovels. The men filled the tubs of coal, and the crane then coming up along the gantry and lifting the coal out of the ship right onto the coal bank. Here's the SS Jade and the White Haven, the SS Air, all the ships carrying up to three and up and four and five hundred tons of coal. Moss bank nuts every piece of coal uniform in size. What a sight that was to see that lying down around the wall of the docks there. Donnelly's Coal Yard, Spencer Dock. Oh, it's like a ghost town today. But what it was in those early post-war years and right into the 50s, a mountain, a hive of activity. Breasters, carters, fillers, tappers out, singers on, men, button men and casuals waiting to ruin the reed. All the wagons railed down along here. This here was the Weybridge. That was my old office there and behind the toilets and the fillers hut. Mountains upon mountains of black diamonds of coal right down to the end. What a sight that was. Eight o'clock in the morning, a hundred horse cars, a couple of old steam cars and one or two motors. Come in there and tear, pull off Nettie, 1900 weight, right John, Casey, Derrington, Finnegan, Gilchrist and Hooley. Then the men came back in here across into the office. There was a passageway here. Glass partition. Give us that two-ton for the port and docks, a handy hole of a drop in Westmoreland Street. 
What is next on it? Anything there for Ayrton Sanders? Well, hail, rain or snow, they never let the old hospitals down or the emergency deliveries. Even if it was teeming rain or you were up to their ankles in snow, they went down with their shovels and pushed aside the water and got in and loaded the ringing wet coal bags to bring out the coal to the hospitals. All these used to say, ah, sure, God love the poor patients. We can't let them down, Mr. T. Come on, give us that six ton for Vincent's. And what about Mercer's and the Mead? Did they get theirs? There was great spirit here among the Dublin Dockers. They, they were a family. They were a great community to work with. But what life and what sadness and what laughter oh. here at the Waybridge in Donnelly's the Spencer Dock. The British and Irish Steam Packet Company. Well, they had their first offices here in 1836. And this was their transit shed. To me, it looks like a building that was built by famine relief work. The chain hoist was worked actually by a water pump. There's the ball and chain. And of course, the hook was for sticking into the sacks and was hooked up and taken up into this transit shed to be waste customs clearance and rail. John Bean's Mariner Man, made of iron and steel bolts and nuts, a wonderful symbol of the iron men that sail the wooden ships. The Point Depot. This was at one time the Coast Guard Station, all the customs. The engineers of the Port and Dock lived at the Point Building. Of course, the railway meant a very big development to the port, taking the stuff right off the ship onto the rail. The only tragedy about progress and container shipping is that it does away with an awful lot of employment where there'd be 40 or 50 men to a boat. Now there's a half a dozen to a container ship. I think I'd rather see the old days with all the sacking and all the people employed. Containers, maybe progress but certainly not for workers. Wouldn't you imagine they'd leave that bit for the pigeons? Now, sweep up the last grain. But you know, that crane is not going to lift all that. A little bit will have to spill out.
Castle Forbes, AD 1729. This is the heart of the North Lots. Now, George Forbes, he was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, and he got a lot here. He also got a lot over in the South Lots, Forbes Street, and he built his castle. Now, 1729 makes this a very interesting stone because the first stone house on the north side of the city was supposed to have been Tyrone House in Marlborough Street, 1729. It's possible that the first stone house in Dublin was George Forbes's castle here in the centre of the North Lots in Dublin. Now, Matt Talbot walked around in Martin's yard and he used to come down through Forbes Street and along here, walked along, up to Lightens O'Toole's church to Mass every morning. The spire of St. Lightens O'Toole Church overlooking the Dublin docks. Isn't it a pity to pull down St. Barnabas? And across that bridge went Matt Talbot down to Mass on the yard of Martins. No timber here today. Only barbed wire, weeds, grass, Ginny Joe. Ginny Joe, Ginny Joe, lay me an egg. I'm going back to school. This is St. Lydon's O'Toole School in Seville Place. This is where Joe Clark, the veteran of the Battle of Mount Street Bridge, came in to learn his penny book many, many years ago. Well, this is where Joe Clark started school. Of course, in those days, you had the old-fashioned desk, and the master probably sat in that corner up on a high desk. Well, there was a little boy who started off in this school by the name of Frank Cal. And of course he graduated higher up along the ladder and out and into the college and became a teacher and came back to this school and taught in it for 50 years. Frank Cal. You know, all the old school masters in the old days when we were kids, they all got little poems and doggerels. I wonder did Frank ever get one, but there was a great old teacher up in Pibsborough, St. Peter's, Joe Sleet. And the kids used to sing about Joe. Old Joe, he was a bow. He went to Mass each Sunday. He prayed to God to give him strength to bash the kids on Monday. And then, of course, it came around to the holidays, holiday time. And we'd all sit, banging our feet off the floor and slapping the desk. No more Irish, no more French. No more sitting on a hard old bench. Knock on the door, knock on the stairs, and throw old Roebuck down the stairs. I hope old Johnny Roebuck's not listening to me today. But uh, as Paddy Crosby in his school around the corner used to say, you didn't learn too much, but the old school left its touch, and the school around the corner is just the same. The children of Sheriff Street are warm and friendly, with laughing eyes, the same as children anywhere. And given half a chance, will grow up to be the salt of the Dublin air. But you'll have no playgrounds, you won't find any football fishes, or swimming pools, or tennis courts in Sheriff Street. And the tragedy is too, that when they leave school, they've no work. Years ago, there would be work here. Now, there is nothing but the dawn. Sing up there, girls, and let them hear the golden voices of the children of Sheriff Street. Sheriff Street runs into Lardens O'Toole's church. St. Lardens O'Toole's is not just a parish church. It's a community centre. Its railings are a playground. Its walls are seats for old men. It's a centre where the children gather, a focal point, here in the heart of the city of Dublin.
Captain McGorks front garden. <laughs> I used to have a nice hill, little flower beds in along there. Grass, nice and clear. And the old Ginny Jaws. Do you remember when we were kids with the Ginny Jaws? One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. Time for tea.